Welcome to your monthly update on the Covidence UK study. Uh, my name's Adrian Martineau, I'm the Chief Investigator. So we're making good progress with antibody testing. Uh, we have around half of the samples uh, now processed and reported back to participants. Still uh, 7,500 samples to go. My apologies to those of you who are still waiting patiently. Rest assured, we're pulling out all the stops to get these results to you as soon as we can. In terms of the detail of how we're doing that, uh, we have two factors now in our favour. Uh, the first is that uh, there's a new analyzer that's just up, up and running in uh, Professor Alex Richter's lab at the University of Birmingham, where the samples are being processed. Um, and secondly, we've now got a large team of medical students who've come online and are helping to uh, run the samples. So uh, if you're still waiting for your antibody results, I'm hopeful that we should be able to get it to you in the next month. Uh, we're working as hard as we can, and thanks for your patience. Now, of course, that we are able to report more of the antibody results, we've had quite a few uh, comments coming in via Twitter and email. So thanks for those. Thanks for sharing them. Um, I just want to run over a few as I think they may be of interest to the uh, study population more widely. Um, this participant got his results and it was positive. He didn't find it too surprising as he was unwell the first week of February while on a skiing holiday in the Dolomites. The illness felt unusual to him. He goes on to say that when he got his first vaccine dose in February, he had a bad reaction. Um, but this got better after about two days. He's read that this type of reaction is common for people who previously had COVID. Well, indeed, there is some evidence that uh, people who've had COVID before may get a more severe reaction to the vaccine. Um, this is a report from the COVID Symptom Tracker app, which I believe a number of you are taking part in, as well as COVID in UK, which is consistent with that idea. Um, the take home message here really is uh, to encourage you when you complete your monthly questionnaire this time around to please record details of any symptoms you get after your COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the two things we're going to look at in particular, are first of all, to see who is most at risk of such symptoms. For example, finding out whether people who've had COVID previously or who've got an antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 before vaccination are at greater risk of getting a reaction to the vaccine. I think the second, uh, perhaps more important point, is to look at whether or not uh, having symptoms predicts whether the vaccine is more effective, both in terms of preventing COVID-19 in the future and also in terms of predicting uh, more vigorous antibody and T-cell responses to the vaccine, which we hope we'll be able to assess with a follow-up round of immunological testing in the summer. I think the second uh, important point to note here from this story is the fact that we were able to detect antibodies uh, more than a year now after the uh, first incidence of COVID-19 in this participant. And this story is uh, not isolated. We had a couple of other participants who've written in, uh, one literally crying with relief upon receiving my positive antibody result a year after being ill, when of course antigen testing wasn't available. And another participant who was amazed to learn they had antibodies they can only put it down to around this time last year when they couldn't taste anything for about two weeks. So what I think these two uh, anecdotes uh, highlight is that although uh, for other antibody studies, particularly those that have used lateral flow testing, um, there's some evidence that antibody responses can wane. The particular antibody test that we're using in COVID-19 UK is really super sensitive and we can pick up quite reliably infections that occurred more than a year previously. So to uh, just accentuate those points, um, the test we're using can detect antibodies reliably at one year post-infection. Uh, and our test is more sensitive than lateral flow tests, either the tests that sometimes come through the post uh, done by the REACT study and others where people can do their own antibody testing at home. Because we're using a test that actually performed in the lab, there are long delays to results. I appreciate that it does mean that we can use a test that's got really, really high performance and high sensitivity. And putting that uh, high sensitivity together with the risk factor data which you've provided for our questionnaires really makes the confidence data set uniquely valuable in terms of identifying both the risk factors for infection long ago, but also in picking up uh, potential long term consequences of even asymptomatic infection. Um, here's another comment from a participant who received an email informing them that their result was positive. Uh, the went email went on to say that they possibly caught COVID without them being aware. While the participant accepted this was possible, they found it quite unlikely. They resided in a small village where only two cases had been reported, both of which were contacted outside of the community. Uh, moreover, the participants stuck rigidly to the government's uh, rules, so much so that their wife called them the COVID police. 
So what are the chances then of somebody having a false positive result? Well, we know from validation work done on the uh, antibody test, which we're using, that 0.7% or seven in 1,000 uh, people can have a false positive result. And this is thought possibly to occur due to uh, a, a very small degree of cross-reactivity in the assay to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, of course, versus other seasonal coronaviruses, which are causing the common cold. But really, the assay was designed to minimise this cross-reactivity, and it's been successful insofar as you can see that that's a very, very low false positive rate. To put this in context, we're doing around 15,000 tests, uh, and we're estimating that around 20% of people will have had previous infection. At that rate, we would expect there to be 2,889 true positives and 84 false positives. In other words, of all the positive results that we get in the study, we would expect 97.2% of them to be true positives. So if you do get a positive result and it's unexpected, our interpretation would be that it's much more likely to be a true positive result and that you've had asymptomatic infection than for your result to be a false positive. And this is really borne out by a couple of lines of evidence from elsewhere in the literature. One study by uh, Daniel Oran and colleagues in the Annals of Internal Medicine in September of last year, showing just how common asymptomatic infection is. Uh, this is a systematic review of serology studies done throughout the world, showing that 40 to 45 percent of SARS-CoV-2 infections actually occur without any symptoms at all. And it's also borne out by data from the Covidence UK study itself just showing how infectious this virus is and how uh, various factors can affect your risk of getting infected. So despite shielding behaviour, we've shown that actually shielding does not have a statistically significant effect on in reducing uh, risk of uh, COVID-19 in the cohort, just underlining how infectious this virus is. Um, conversely, we've shown that even things like the number of visits to other households that people have had associate with increased risk, about a 30 percent increased risk per extra visit to a household in the previous week uh, um, of completing the questionnaire. And also visits to the shops and other indoor public places such as cafes, etc. You can see a strong dose response relationship here with people having more visits being up to 2.6 times more likely to get COVID-19 than those who haven't been to any shop or indoor public place in the last week. So what these data go to show, I think, is that they just underline how easy it is to get infected, how infectious this virus is, and how easy it could be to get asymptomatic infection, even though one's sticking uh, rigidly to the rules. So the take home message here, SARS-CoV-2 is highly infectious, asymptomatic infection is very common, and our monthly questionnaires are designed to capture any long-term consequences. So I know that uh, some of you are finding it a little bit onerous to uh, answer the questions around fatigue and breathlessness every month, but I would really encourage you to stick with us and do it because what we can tell from that is whether or not there are uh, long-term consequences of people who had SARS-CoV-2 infection, didn't realise it, but in whom it may be actually affecting their long-term health, even though they didn't know they were infected. So please stick with those questions. They do provide us with such valuable information. So what are our plans for the month ahead? Well, number one priority, of course, is to make good on our promise to get the antibody results to you. Uh, and we're going to be throwing everything at getting those processed and reported. Um, we've also got uh, some news in the post, hopefully, uh, around the outcome of a funding application, which we put in to support a second round of antibody testing in June and July. And this is primarily going to be aimed at people who've had the vaccine. We're going to be answering two main questions. The first, what are the determinants of response to the vaccine? So who responds well and who responds less well in terms of antibody response to vaccine? And then we're going to use that information moving forward to see whether particular degrees of antibody response after vaccination can be associated with uh, good or less good protection against COVID-19 moving ahead into the autumn and winter uh, of 2021. Finally, uh, we're going to be uh, finalising uh, new statistical analyses which are looking at predictors of test confirmed COVID-19. So you remember that in previous monthly webinars, I've talked about uh, risk factors for symptom defined disease. This, of course, represents uh, an approximation as to whether or not somebody's had COVID-19. But now that the second wave has come and gone, sufficient 
participants in Covidence UK have now had test confirmed disease for us to now run a second analysis to see whether those results around risk factors seen in the symptom defined definition can be replicated for a bona fide uh, test confirmed disease. So I hope to have results of that for you in next month's webinar. So for now, uh, from all of us here at Covidence UK to all of you, thank you for taking part. And until next month, goodbye.